Well, as Mike mentioned, the talk today, today will be different from other ones we've done on the past about Gettysburg. This is going to be about the other Berg, Vicksburg. As Mike mentioned, they both, both Vicksburg and Gettysburg, occurred about the same time in the same month, actually, or ended, uh, Vicksburg ended in the same month, the day after Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg was over. Uh, before I get into it, I'd like to thank a couple of assistants, Silent Sam, the infantry man, uh, Sam, the sailor man, Short Sam, the sailor man. Uh, you might know his brother, Long John Silver. This is Short John Silver. Uh, why have a Navy uniform? Vicksburg was a land campaign, right? No, it wasn't. It was a joint campaign between the Army and the Navy, and the, the Navy actually started it back with the fall of New Orleans, which we'll get into a little bit. Uh, let's play the video right now. This is one of the short videos from the Civil War Trust. I should point out that I want to thank Mike for putting together the power presentation. Oh, uh, just the front one. Yeah. The northern boats tested the strong Confederate river battery at Port Hudson or in Vicksburg, known as the Gibraltar of the Confederacy. President Abraham Lincoln claimed Vicksburg the key to winning the Civil War. But by late 1862, Union naval efforts there had failed. mentioned, I want to thank Mike for putting together the PowerPoint. Uh, my version of a PowerPoint is to talk loud and point. So, so Mike's a little bit more sophisticated. The importance of Vicksburg as opposed to Gettysburg. We all hear about Gettysburg because it was in the East. That's where the politicians were. That's where most of the newspapers were. And that's where the foreign uh, politicians were, representatives of the foreign uh, countries. But Vicksburg was, in my mind, 
of much more strategic importance than Gettysburg. And it also had a political importance too, not from foreign countries, but from domestic. Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. Before the war, had all been using the Mississippi as a means of taking their farm products to market. When the war broke out and the Confederates closed the Mississippi, that created quite a financial burden on people from that Midwestern area. They put a lot of pressure on Lincoln to do something about it. Also, and we don't, most books don't talk about this too much, but the cotton speculators wanted to get into Louisiana and into Texas to get the cotton to sell to the foreign uh, countries, which uh, the South had put in, well, the, the North had put an embargo on cotton uh, through the blockade, and the South, probably in a, a bad idea, had restricted selling cotton, hoping that that would force France and Great Britain, Great Britain to take their side. Let's go to the next one. This shows the problems of taking Vicksburg. Mississippi is coming down here. There is a bend in the Mississippi called Millican's Bend right there that forces any boats, ships to go around there passing by Vicksburg. The point yeah, I just remember that. Of course, I got a pointer right here, but, but it keeps putting holes in the screen. <laughs> uh, So this area here is just around Vicksburg, both to the north and to a certain extent to the east. It's just surrounded by bay, uh, bios, uh, swamps, making it very difficult for an overland campaign coming from the north. The ideal thing would be to come down the Mississippi and then cross over or come down on the uh, west side. Problem with that was, as we'll see, that the Confederates had fortified Vicksburg and further down 250 river miles south, Port Hudson, making it very difficult to get ships down the Mississippi. Let's go to the next one. Vicksburg is on a bluff, and I forget the height of it, but it's high enough that it was very, very difficult for guns of the gunboats and the uh, saltwater navy, for that matter, to reach up on the bluffs. Those bluffs extended pretty much all the way around, so it was a very easily defended fortification and very hard to attack subsequently. Again, back to the Navy's role, where it all started. And actually the title of this talk, rather than being the Vicksburg campaign, probably should have been opening the Mississippi. Because it started back in April of 1862 when Admiral Farragut, that happens to be his flagship there, the Hartford, passed the Confederate batteries at Fort Jackson and Fort St. Philip, proceeded up the Mississippi and captured New Orleans. The forts later fell and once he was there, his instructions were 
to proceed upriver and capture Vicksburg. Well, he certainly proceeded upriver. The second part of that didn't happen. That's Admiral Farragut, who commanded the fleet that captured New Orleans. New Orleans fell without a fight. As he proceeded upriver to Natchez, or to, I'm sorry, to Baton Rouge, it fell without a fight. Then up to Natchez. Natchez fell without a fight. So why wouldn't Vicksburg fall without a fight? Well, one report says that when he got to Vicksburg, he sent a messenger in to the courthouse, or I guess to the military commander, uh, request, uh, ordering them to surrender, and the reply came back, Mississippians do not know how to surrender. If you'd care to teach us, come on on. So uh, he only had 1,400 troops with him. As I mentioned, it was virtually impossible for his guns to be elevated enough to reach the top of the bluffs. He went back down to New Orleans. Another problem, his ships were deep water ships. They took a lot of water to keep them afloat. The Mississippi, as we all know, fluctuates tremendously. They had to stick to the channel if they could find it. Uh, the gunners at Vicksburg and other, Port Hudson and other places knew where the channel was. Pretty easy just to zero in on the channel. Let's go to the next one. David Dixon Porter was also involved by the time uh, of the actual campaign on Vicksburg. He was to the north of Vicksburg. Farragut still had his ships to the south. Go ahead. Union forces, the Army of the Tennessee. Now, go back. Can you go back just a moment? That word is important. The Tennessee, meaning the Army of the Tennessee River. After Vicksburg, another army was put in the field by the Confederates called the Army of Tennessee. So many historians, amateur historians like myself, get that confused. The difference between the Tennessee, meaning the river, and Tennessee, meaning, of course, the state. Go ahead. The man in overall charge, of course, was General Grant. The major general at the time, as we'll see, the Union Army anyway had more major generals than you could shake a stick at. Uh, one of the problems was, in the Union Army anyway, they didn't want to make any lieutenant generals because Washington was a lieutenant general, and at least in the politician's mind, nobody could be equal to Washington, so therefore, at least early on in the war, until 64 for that matter, there were no lieutenant generals in the Northern Army. William Sherman, he, one of uh, Grant's subordinates, commanded the 15th Corps and played quite an active role in the Vicksburg campaign. How did they distinguish him? Was it by seniority? In other words, if you got four major generals, how did they distinguish Yeah, I, I, I was going to get into that, but it, it's a good, good question. Uh, date of rank meant everything. I mean, even if you were a professional, and I think Rich will probably get into this in the Glorietta thing, but even if you were a professional, and a political general, date of rank was 
the day before your date of rank, he would be superior to you, regardless of the fact that you might have a lot more experience, a lot more training. It was not a good system. The South had the same problems. And believe me, everybody knew the date of rank of everybody else. <laughs> James McPherson. When I first started studying the Civil War, I was fascinated by him because his middle name is Birdseye. And I thought that meant he started a frozen food company. But <laughs> also a major general and a very competent corps commander, later gets killed during the Atlanta campaign. This is an example of what I was talking to, talking about. He was a political general, friend of Lincoln, had no military experience, had been a congressman from Illinois and petitioned Lincoln to get a command. He got the command. Lincoln made him a major general. Not one of his best moves. However, because McLaren went straight to Lincoln, bypassing the Secretary of War and the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, uh, a man named Halleck, it thoroughly irritated them. And instead of commanding the Vicksburg campaign like he thought he was going to do, he ended up commanding the 13th Corps under Grant. But here again, date of rank came into play. His immediate subordinate, was Sherman, who had a lot more experience, had been a, f a fighter for some time, but because of data rank, he was senior to Sherman. Probably McPherson, but I don't know about that. Confederate forces, problems of a divided command. The North wasn't the only one that had problems that way. Jefferson Davis, self-proclaimed military genius, president of the Confederacy, had been a graduate of West Point, had been Secretary of War, and had commanded a regiment of Mississippi volunteers during the Mexican War. This, of course, made him a military genius. Joseph Pemberton, full general. Johnston. Jo I'm sorry, Johnson. Yeah, but it still says Lieutenant General. So <laughs> uh, full general. A man of pretty, pretty good talents, but was continually at war with Jefferson Davis. Back to seniority. When the Confederacy was established, or the Provisional Army of the Confederacy was established, Jefferson Davis appointed Robert E. Lee as a senior, a man named Samuel Cooper, who I believe was a Quartermaster General, as the next senior, Albert Sidney Johnston, the third, and then Joe Johnston. Joe Johnston always thought that he should have been the most senior general in the Confederate Army. Davis didn't agree with him. They were literally at each other's throats throughout the war. And that, of course, created great command problems. Next. Lieutenant General John Pemberton, as the video said, he was a Pennsylvanian, but married a lady from Virginia. And as we all know, behind every man is a successful woman. 
nagging. Ah, she uh, got him to join the Confederate Army. And he, he gets a lot of flack, but actually he was certainly competent. But the big problem that arose was that there were two different philosophies about Vicksburg. Johnston, who was in overall command of that area, wanted to give up Vicksburg, unite Johnson's army and Pemberton's army, defeat Grant, and his theory was, then we can walk back into Vicksburg. Doesn't, doesn't make any difference. Both Pemberton and Davis said, no, we have to hold Vicksburg. So what, uh, what ended up was you had two Confederate armies, and is the next one a map that shows this a little bit? Well, this, this gets an 18th Oh, all, all right, well. We'll come back. Anyway, uh, what it ended up was you had Johnson's army to the east of Vicksburg, Pemberton's army in Vicksburg, and a guy named Grant in between. Uh, that does not make for very good communication and consolidation. Grant, at least in the history books that I read when I was in high school, you had the idea that Grant was simply a bulldog, that all he knew about was going straight ahead. I believe that's terribly unfair. He did get that reputation mainly during the Peninsula Campaign that ended up with the fall of Richmond. But he didn't have too much choice there. The Vicksburg Campaign shows how he kept thinking, how he kept trying other things. When one didn't work, he didn't just give up. He just kept trying something else. Originally, his idea was to come down straight from the north on the east side of the river and attack Vicksburg from the east. Problem was that made for a very, very long supply line. Holly Springs, which I, I can't see where it, it's up there someplace. It's where he had his supply depot. It was raided by the Confederates. Wasn't helped by a very incompetent not colonel that was guarding it for the Union. And his supplies were destroyed. That was his first attempt. He did not give up. He then tried various other things. He tried uh, some place in here is the Yazoo River that comes in above Vicksburg. I should uh, mention that all during this time, the Union forces, Navy particularly, have been coming down the Mississippi. They had taken Memphis. So there was quite a large Union naval force here. After the fall of New Orleans and Farragut's attempt to take New Orleans, he went back downriver, reported to the Secretary of, uh, to the Secretary of the Navy that he thought it was impossible for his deep water ships to be of much use. And uh, he was overruled. So he went back up and actually got past Vicksburg and united with Porter's fleet who had come down this way. Can I make a comment, Bob? Yes. And, uh, the big thing about the first campaign is the approach was a traditional one where it said you have to bring all your supplies with you. Hence the approach they took was to come down the major rail line that kind of came down from Tennessee and from Mississippi. But again, what you learned very quickly 
is the longer it got, your less your ability to actually defend a rail line. It's a lot easier for cavalry to come and lift it up behind you. Exactly what happened. Uh, Forrest came there with a large force, captured everything at Holly Springs, which was their main logistics thing, which then forced Grant to retire. But it's interesting. He, the one thing he tried as, he, as they retired is he put together groups of soldiers with wagons and scouts and support and sent them out into the countryside. Because the, the basic understanding was there's not enough food in the countryside to support you. Well, what he found out is once you sent this out about 15 miles on either side, there was all sorts of food out there and plenty to support them. Well, um and that was what he put in his reminiscences, gave him the idea that you can cut away from your main supply base. Yeah, that I was going to get into that, but there were several lessons learned during this campaign by Grant. One, as Mike said, about not relying on your uh, line of supply and a fellow named Sherman who was hanging around with Grant at that time learned that lesson in his march to the sea from Atlanta. The, again, the thing about Grant that I really impressed me. First of all, he didn't give up after the first attempt or the second or the third or the fourth. He just kept trying. And he learned from his mistakes. Seldom, in fact, I can't think of any mist well, one mistake he made twice, but uh, he, he was a lot more complex, a lot more gifted than he was later given credit for when he was labeled the a butcher. Go ahead. You want to comment about the Freeman's Bureau? Yeah, that's, that, thank you, Ann. Uh, one of the things that Grant did, as he was going south, he was inundated by freed slaves. The kingdom coming. They had all of a sudden freedom. And here was the Union Army. Well, he had a real problem trying to feed them, trying to equip them. So he established what became the Freedmen's Bureau. He got a chaplain from one of his regiments who organized a whole system where these slaves, ex-slaves, would then work the plantations that had been abandoned by their masters and other people, and they would be paid in kind in other words, you work for us, we'll pay you with food and clothing and other things. This not only created another source of foodstuffs, but it solved the problems of what to do with these thousands of refugees. Is there anything else up there that I can't read? Bob? Yes. During those one, two, three, four attempts, how many troops did he lose? Did he lose a lot of other troops? The, it, it, not as many as you would think. Uh, the um, Civil War Trust, in one of their videos, which we'll show towards the end, says, puts the total number of casualties for both sides at around 10,000 each, which is certainly a lot, but that includes wounded, missing, and it does not include the 30,000 that Grant captured at Vicksburg. So the one thing that I don't know in those figures is how many of those were battlefield casualties and how many were by disease. This was not a very nice climate for northern boys to be in. Malaria, typhoid, I'm sure it took their toll 
And whether or not that's included in that 10,000, I have no idea. I mentioned the deep water Navy, that they actually as early as 60, late 62, early, er, I mean late 61, early 62, the Navy came up with the brown water Navy, the gunboats. Cairo being one of them, there were seven, I believe, called the city class gunboats. Uh, interestingly enough, named after city. Uh, this is the Cairo, spelled C-A-I-R-O, but is the Cairo. They were quite effective. Cairo had a unique place in history. Next. It was the first ship ever blown up by an underwater mine. Confederates called them torpedoes. But this is on the Yazoo River. That, of course, is the Cairo. And these rather stunned sailors are wondering what just happened. The Navy was not unaware of the torpedoes. But so far, none, none of them had worked. That was the first one. Later on, as technology improved, 43 Union ships were either sunk or badly damaged by underwater mines. Uh, if you've ever been to Vicksburg, you've probably seen the remains of the Cairo. They've got a very nice display the Cairo was found sunk in the Yazoo River in the 1960s. They raised it. Unfortunately, didn't have very good technology. They put cables underneath it, raised it, and ended up with two Cairo's. Uh, the front half and the back half. <laughs> but they've made a very nice display on the Vicksburg Battlefield Park of the Cairo. The second campaign. By this time, Grant had figured out that coming down on the east side with his long supply line just wasn't going to work. And he did various things in here. He sent uh, Sherman up the Yazoo River with the idea of attacking Vicksburg from the north at a place called Chickasaw Bluffs. That didn't work. He also tried at some point sending Porter's gunboat up the Yazoo, try to get around Vicksburg. That didn't work for various reasons. Uh, the Confederates knew they were coming, would chop down trees over the river uh, put snipers to clear the decks, uh, use artillery. It just didn't work. One of the things that I'd forgotten about, right across from Vicksburg, the little town called DuPont. Unbeknownst to the Union, a planter before the war had established a private telegraph line from DuPont up to around here someplace. So every time Sherman, excuse me, and every time Grant started something different, the information would just be telegraphed down to DuPont, or DuMont, du 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 DuMont, yeah. And uh, somebody would cross the river and tell Pemberton. They tried various things. They tried digging a canal across Milliken's Bend so that they could bypass Vicksburg. Interestingly enough, if you vi visit Vicksburg now, the river bypasses Vicksburg. In fact, in order to keep the uh, casino boat afloat and, uh, and, and get the... Uh, 
cruise ships in there, they have to keep dredging a canal so you can actually get to Vicksburg because the path of the river has changed. Also tried eventually moving troops down this way, but you're still on the wrong side of the river. One of his diversions is this when we uh, talk about Grierson? Or? Uh, no, uh, it comes right after Blaine oh. Gauntlet. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, in order to get troops from the west side of the river to the east side, you had to have transports. In April, I can't think of the date, 16th, maybe? 16th April. Uh, Porter ran the gauntlet of the guns at Vicksburg. He put gunboats on the east side and transports on the west side so that the fire from Vicksburg would hit the gunboats, not the transports. One point. At the beginning of the war, and actually throughout the war, cooperation between Army and Navy was spotty. Not here. Both Porter and Farragut worked very closely with Grant and his commanders, and things worked very good between them, which has had a lot to do with the success, the eventual success of the campaign. Ah. Canvas ironclad, actually it was more like plywood, well not plywood, they didn't have plywood, but canvas and wood. In February, actually before they ran the gauntlet, in February of uh, 63, a, conf a Union ironclad, the Indianola, was captured by the Confederates below Vicksburg. It went aground, it was underwater, but the Confederates were working to raise it and use it, and it was an extremely powerful ship. Porter was very concerned about this, so he came up with this. This is a barge. That's just wood. These are barrels with a smoke pot underneath them to make it look like it was had a, a, a furnace there, boilers going. The pilot house was made out of canvas. And on the side of the fake paddle wheel housing, it says, deluded people give in. And he sent that adrift. It floated down past Vicksburg, was approaching the salvage crew working on the Indian NOLA, and they were absolutely convinced that this powerful ironclad was going to blow them out of the water. So they blew up the Indian Indianola. So uh, the funny thing was this went aground upstream from it, but they were assuming that they, this powerful ironclad was just gearing up for an attack, and so they blew up the Indianola. But they got a lot of free lumber and a pirate flag out of it, so uh, the looted people give in. So there was nobody on there? It just floated down the room? There was nobody on there. Uh, it was completely fake. There might have been, I'm just assuming that in order to get it in the main channel, they probably towed it there and had a couple of people on board just to make sure it got in the channel and then took them off. But no, it just floated on down. So thirty April eighteen sixty three, after the ships had run the gauntlet, 
Grant sends McLaren, McLaren down the left side. He was having lots of problems with McLaren. McLaren again thought he should be in charge. Uh, would write bombastic reports about how his core had done so very well. Again, communicating directly, in many cases, to Lincoln, bypassing the chain of command. Uh, Grant and he were at odds, obviously. And, but because of the politics involved, Grant was reluctant to get rid of him initially. They had, again, once they got the transports down here, Grant was able to move across to the East Bank. He had many diversions going. I mentioned digging, uh, trying to dig the uh, canal. There was also another canal dug on the uh, west, east side, west side of the river. Uh, down through a bunch of bayous to get ships through. That didn't work out very well. But as a diversion, as he was crossing the Mississippi, getting prepared to cross, he had Sherman make another mock attack on Chickasaw Bluffs, which completely fooled Pemberton. He was absolutely certain that the main threat was coming from the north again. And then he sent a cavalry raid from LaGrange, Tennessee, 1,700 men commanded by Grierson. Originally, they were supposed to cut the railroads and then go back to LaGrange. Uh, because of all the concentration of Confederate troops that were sent out to get him, Grierson decided he'd just keep going south. He ended up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 600 miles from a starting point, 16 days later, had completely preoccupied Pemberton with his raid. He cut several rail lines. This picture shows his cavalry shortly after they got to Baton Rouge. Interesting thing about Grierson, every picture you'll see of him shows his right side, never the left. He hated horses. Not a great recommendation for a cavalryman. <laughs> uh, he uh, was kicked by a pony when he was, I think, eight years old, has a scar on his left side, when he offered his services to the Union Army at the beginning of the war, General Halleck said, I'm going to put you in charge of a cavalry regiment. He said, I hate horses. I'm a musician. I don't want to be in the cavalry. He was overruled, stayed in the cavalry, of course, throughout the war and after the war. After the war, he commanded the 10th, I believe it was the 10th, U.S. colored troops, the Buffalo Soldiers, after the war. But he was a musician. He would quite often on the march, I don't know if you know what a Jew's harp is, but it's a little thing that you can play like this. He would serenade his troops playing the Jew's harp as they were going on. But he turned out to be a very good cavalryman, even though he hated horses. He made several diversions on his way down to Baton Rouge, completely fooling the Confederates that were chasing him. He sent one regiment back north. The Confederates took the bait and followed that regiment instead of Grierson on his way down to Baton Rouge. But he, the main thing he did was he kept Pemberton looking east instead of south where Grant was coming in. The movie of the horse soldiers, if you've ever seen it, John Wayne and all that, he 
could say is loosely modeled after the raid that Grierson made. And he doesn't look anything like John Wayne. <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm glad Mike brought that up because, yes, the movie very loosely based on the raid. But the main things of the movie, of course, there's a great line in the movie that uh, can think of the guy that offhand that played the doctor. Yeah. But he mentions to the political colonel of one of the regiments that, Colonel, your coffee would taste better if you built the latrines downstream <laughs> rather than upstream. Uh, but there are two main points in the movie that really happen. One, the attack on Newton Station and destroying the railroads there. That wasn't the only one they destroyed. Uh, and towards the very end, there's this fight at a bridge. Well, there was a fight at the bridge. Uh, in efforts to divert the Confederate cavalry, not only did he send the one regiment north, but he had Company B of, I forget which regiment, go off to the east, and he sort of gave him up for lost. He hadn't heard anything. And so he's, as he's proceeding south, he's burning bridges. The captain of Company B is trying to catch up, but he's sort of impeded by all these burning bridges. He finally sends a courier, two of them actually, one of them was his brother, to find Grierson and point out that he would rather burn his own bridges so that he could catch up, <laughs> which he did. So I forget how many people he lost, but it's something like a dozen, not very many, but tied up lots and lots of Confederate troops. Okay. This and I want to thank Mike for this because this is very important. Grant finally crosses. He does not cross at Grand Gulf where he was originally decided to cross because it was heavily fortified. He crosses down here at Bruinsburg and when Pemberton finally figures out where he is, he assumes that he will come straight north. He doesn't. He goes east to Jackson, the capital of Mississippi, and a major manufacturing hub. Completely fools Pemberton, and there's a small battle here at Port Gibson, which is won by the Union. It forces the troops at Port Gibson and at Grand Gulf to abandon their fortifications and try to get back to Vicksburg, which most of them do. But he gets to Jackson. He burns all the factories at Jackson, tears up the railroad line, and then comes west. There are two major battles, one at Champions Hill, and I guess one major battle at Champions Hill, which is sort of a, could have gone either way, but Grant wins. But here, after he leaves Jackson, Johnston moves into Jackson. Johnson is sending messages to Pemberton saying, come on out, combine our forces, we can defeat Grant, because we'll outnumber him, which they would have. But Pemberton's getting orders from Davis, no, you must defend Vicksburg. So it ends up, as I said earlier, with divided command, one force here, one force there. 
and the blue guys in the middle. Grant is victorious at Champions Hill, moves on to the big, the big Black River, which is not too much of a contest because the Confederates that have defended Champions Hill are somewhat demoralized and want to really just want to get back into Vicksburg. And they do that. Grant is somewhat misled by their dispirited defense at the Big Black, figures that Vicksburg will just fall. So he makes a frontal attack, which fails. He thinks that he, if he had things organized better, he could succeed, succeed with a frontal attack. So he tries it again, and I forget the dates when he tries it. 19th and 22nd. Yeah. In his memoirs, Grant says, he regrets two things. The Battle of Cold Harbor in, the, uh, in 1864 and the second attack at Vicksburg. Because again, the, man, the Confederates are on high ground. The Union has to attack up, uphill, if you will. At least one report says he wanted to break off the attack. But McClellan says, oh no, I've got troops on, on the parapet. We need to keep going. Well, I don't know. Maybe one guy had put a flag up, but that was it. So the attack continues, and it was a disaster. McClellan then writes a wonderful report that is published in the newspapers about, it doesn't actually say that Grant was at fault, but he implies that his troops would have won with more support. That was the straw that broke McLaren's back. Grant fires him. And he uses uh, Colonel Wilson to deliver the report to McLaren. Wilson and McLaren had been at odds already. Wilson puts on his best dress uniform and goes and delivers this order to McLaren. McLaren looks at it and he says, well, sir, I guess we're both relieved. And that's the end of McLaren. He disappears from the scene. Any idea who that is? Well, let me put it this way. His descendant is quite prominent in Colorado politics. Notice the high forehead, rather thin. His descendant also had a lot to do with beer. That is Andrew Hickenlooper. Looks like... Yeah, that was my point. <laughs> yeah, uh, he also gets into politics after the war. He becomes lieutenant governor of Ohio. He was that uniform is of a brigadier general. He he was breveted brigadier general at the end of the war. He was actually captain of the fifth Ohio light artillery. In fact. Years and years ago, when the governor, before he was the governor or the mayor, had the Wincoop Brewery, he came out with a flying artillery ale to commemorate probably his great-grandfather. Hickenlooper yeah, uh, was by training an engineer. McPherson needed an engineer on his staff, so he makes him chief engineer on the staff of the 17th Corps. 
one of his major assignments was to, and unfortunately we don't have a slide of this, but to dig a mine under the Confederate fortifications, fill it full of powder, and blow it up. And he does it. Unfortunately, the Confederates figured out what was happening, and so they're countermining. But haven't quite made it when the mine blows. It destroyed the fortifications. They had been, the Confederates had been using not only some soldiers, but also some Negroes, I'm sure volunteers, uh, to dig this countermine. When it blew, one Negro said to have gone about 100 feet in the air and maybe half a mile back and landed in the Union lines unhurt. Now that, th that's sort of a dangerous way to get your freedom, but, <laughs> but it worked. Uh, the mine really didn't work. But they tried it again, this time with a little bit more success. But one, one of the reasons I bring this up is that it shows how Grant learned his lessons. Most of you who have studied the Civil War at all are aware of the Battle of the Crater during the Petersburg Campaign, where General Burnside came up with the idea of building a mine underneath the Confederate fortifications. And I often wondered why Grant was lukewarm to the idea. Well, this explains it. He had seen it tried before with minimum results and was not anticipating that it would work again. So this shows how Grant, I think, it shows how Grant kept learning and kept using his past experiences to achieve results. Next. A lot of people think this shows the civilians of Vicksburg digging in to prevent getting killed by the shell fire, both from the Army and the Navy guns. Actually, this is an Illinois regiment. This is the Union lines, but they dug into the bluffs to protect themselves from Confederate fire. Although the bombardment after the second failed campaign until Vicksburg finally surrendered, although the bombardment was severe, there was really an effort not to, given the technology of the day, not to harm civilians. Many books you read will talk about the terror in Vicksburg, and I'm sure there was terror. But at least according to this one volume I read, total killed of civilians during the 45 days uh, of the siege were 10 to 12 people, and maybe three times that wounded. But they were forced to abandon their homes, in this case, the owners abandoned it and dig caves in the bluffs of Vicksburg to prevent casualties. This is a painting showing an exploding shell and several people taking cover. Little sidelight. I visited Vicksburg many years ago and went to the museum in the courthouse. And among the exhibits they had was a rifle that had been found in, the cave, in one of the caves. And the explanation was Confederate rifle found in the caves where soldiers and civilians were taking cover during the siege. The only problem was the rifle was not made until about 1876. 
So, uh, that, that, that's what it was. Which brings us back to our job here at the museum is to try and accurately label and describe items that we have. Let's play this video. took Grant so long. <laughs> the, the, uh, the video mentions the paroling of prisoners. Well, there were a couple of reasons for doing that. And again, Grant was really thinking ahead. When you parole prisoners, they have to sign a paper saying that they are paroled, will not fight again until exchanged for uh, an equal number of Union prisoners, not only equal in number, but in rank, etc. If Grant had taken them prisoners, he would have, A, had to feed them, B, had to guard them, and C, had to provide transportation to get them north to prison camps. By paroling them, the Confederates had to feed them, and as it turned out, had to guard them. They had what they called parolee camps, because, gee whiz, I can't fight. I'm only 100 miles from home. Guess where I'm going? And probably won't come back. So I think, anyway, that this was a very smart move on Grant's part. I don't know what percentage of those troops did not come back, but it reminds me a little bit of a, a movie that just came out, uh, The Independent country of Jones, which talks about uh, Jones County, Mississippi, which was populated by Confederate deserters who decided they didn't want to fight anymore and they would create their own independent country. I haven't seen the movie. I'm told it's loosely based on history, probably a little closer than John Wayne and the horse soldiers, but, uh, but it did happen. 
So to me, that was a very smart move on Grant's part. The other thing that is interesting, I think, about that whole campaign is in most cases, the Union troops were not as well supplied with weapons as the Confederates. Now, we've talked about the bluffs. In most cases, the Confederate troops are up here. And in most cases, they had these. This is a pattern 1853 Enfield rifle musket. They were imported from Great Britain, and this happens to be a Confederate used one. They were imported from Great Britain, and this is one of the few instances at Vicksburg that I know about where the Union Army traded their guns for the ones captured from the Confederates because For the most part, the Union had these. 69 caliber smoothbore musket. The rifle musket had a range of, heck the sights go up over 500 yards, you're not going to hit anything with that. but. Uh, certainly an accurate range of 100 150 yards. The smoothbore has an accurate range, quote unquote, of about 50 yards. So think about this. The guys at the bottom of the hill have these. The guys on the top of the hill have these. Guess where the advantage is? Not only being on top of the hill, but having a longer reach than the guys at the bottom. So when Grant captured Vicksburg, he traded his weapons. Now, I'm sure he had some rifle muskets, but he traded his weapons for the Confederate weapons. Uh, .577, .58, basically. The, uh, the Enfield was quite popular because it could use the same ammunition as the Model 1861 U.S. rifle musket. So he traded his, his weapons for the Confederate weapons. The, uh, the Navy had the same problems. Some probably mostly the deep water navy that had come up the Mississippi, the sailors could have been armed with a revolver such as this, which is a 36 caliber, excuse me, Colt. But the navy had expanded tremendously. From the beginning of the war, having maybe 40 operational ships, to by the end of the war over 600, including the uh, riverboat vessels, gunboats. So they had to come up with some way to arm their sailors quickly. This is a 54 caliber single shot smoothbore pistol made for the Army. The Navy got 13,000 of them from the Army Depot. Obsolete by the Civil War, or at least obsolescent, but it's better than a rock. Uh, they also had their own version. This is also a Model 1842, 54 caliber, but this was made for the Navy. So the gunboats, the river fleets, had a lot of these obsolescent weapons. The hat, excuse me, the hat here is an original and uh, 
Were you Navy vets? Well, you'd have to be as old as me, I guess, but I wore something similar to this when I was in doing Korea. But, uh, they don't issue them anymore, but this actually was issued to a man named Sharp. Don't know what ship he was on, but that is an original Navy hat of the period. And the one thing about Navy uniforms, they didn't change much. The Navy dress whites nowadays will look just like this, but without the, the blue collar and the blue cuffs. Basically the same. Uh, as you go through the museum, if you go over into the Iraq-Afghanistan room, you'll see a mannequin of a the uniform of a woman sailor, and it's camouflaged. Now, I never quite figured out why the Navy needed a camouflage uniform. <laughs> First of all, it seems to me if you went overboard, it'd be harder to find you. And if it's really going to be camouflaged, shouldn't it have little whales and dolphins and stuff on it? <laughs> but anyway, that's one of the things you might want to see uh, as you go through the museum. Mike, can you think of anything that... Uh... No, I think you covered everything unless there are questions. Yes, sir. Well, when that uh, K-roll uh, was hit for the, tur for the first torpedo, how many died on that particular You know, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think... I don't think anybody was, was killed. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it hit under the hull. I, the, certainly the engine room would have uh, experienced some damage, but they were in very shallow water. In fact, it was so shallow that the Navy, after it sunk and they decided they couldn't raise it, they cleaned everything off that was sticking above the water because they didn't want the Confederates to find it and recover the guns, etc. But if I remember correctly, I, I imagine there were a few headaches, but uh, uh, that was all, I believe. How, how big was the crew? You know, I don't really know, but the Navy, the gunboats of that type tended to have around 100, maybe a few more or less, but I don't really know the answer to that. I don't remember uh, long enough and what happened to it, it sunk. Uh, well, you can see the size of yeah. people. They yeah. pretty big. Yeah, it's pretty big. 60 feet long, 251 octaves in that. Okay, 251. Uh, well, you see, it, it, he's got... Uh, what, four guns to a side, had three guns forward. Uh, I think it had a stern chaser but or two, but I'm not positive on that. And they were flat, flat bottom pretty much, huh? Yeah, yeah, because it was a paddle steamer, if you will. The paddle wheels were covered and centered back there. Uh, you can't really see it there, but... Uh, yeah, it, uh, when Eads built these, Probably back in there. yeah, right, right about there, uh, you know, he, he, he was a pretty good designer. Uh, he, what this does, as Mike said, the paddle wheels here, so the machinery is basically ironclad machinery. Uh, it is protected by the sloping sides of the gunboat. You know, where they are most susceptible, of course, would be from underneath. Other questions? Well, they were ironclad. Wood with an iron skin, if you will. So was the bottom then wood? Yeah. Yes. So that's why the torpedo was yeah, although the, some of those torpedoes were powerful enough that it wouldn't have made any difference. But, uh, yeah, they, uh, I don't remember about these, 
but at least with the coastal ironclads, the armor extended below the waterline to about there just to protect them from uh, waterline damage, if you will. But the, the rest of the hull was wood, yes. Anything else? Sir? Uh, the Indonol, was that a spy ship? You say they sunk it when they saw the canvas gunboat coming? Right. Is that what it was? Uh, well, the ship they sunk was a Union ironclad. Was a very large, didn't even look like that. It was. No, I'm saying the one when they saw the canvas boat coming down there and they panicked, and you said they actually sunk it themselves, didn't you? Yes. The, 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 no, no, no. It was the Indianapolis. I mean, the Indi the, uh, Indianapolis. No, 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 no. It was a gunship. Yeah, it was, it was a gunboat. It was a gunboat. It was a big gunboat. So Ugly gunboat. gunboat. Were, Indianola. What were they afraid of? Was it going to be captured or, or what? Well, yeah. I mean, th that was the whole purpose of it. The Union did not want that very powerful yeah. gunboat to fall back into Confederate hands, to fall into Confederate hands, because they were going to raise it and use it. And someplace at home, I have a picture of it, and it, it well, actually, there's something to give you some idea here. Uh, whoops. You can probably Google it. Yeah. yeah, there there's a pretty good picture here someplace. Which of course I can't find right now, but anyway, there's a it was a big gunboat. And if it had been just a supply ship, uh, Porter wouldn't have cared. But he did not want that big powerful gunboat to be in Confederate hands. Police. You said they signed the document saying I don't want to fight, and then your side had to guard you and hold you. Yes. Place. Yeah. Was that based just on honor that they would not say why don't you just going out and reenlist somewhere else? No, it was to keep them from going home. Yeah. Uh, and not coming back. Couldn't you? Since you had them back, couldn't you just take them and reassign them somewhere else and say you're still in the army? Once they were exchanged. And now the exchange, you know, certainly was it violated? Of course it was. But if I was captured and paroled and for whatever reason decided I wanted to go back and fight, if I was captured again, I was in deep trouble. I would think people brought back then probably had more honor than Oh, I don't think so. No, I mean, I mean, people are people. People are people, and uh, uh, actually, nowadays it would be much easier to track that person than it was back then. And again, back to the independent country of Jones, uh, these guys went home and stayed there. Now, whether they were parolee, parolees or just deserters, I have no idea, but uh, that was the purpose of the system. And yeah, and in order to keep that from happening, you had to guard your own guys from leaving. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the caves and the bluffs, are, are any of those still there? I really don't know the answer to that. I, uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but they've probably been, uh, at least the entrances collapsed to keep people from going in there and dying. One thing that I did not mention, the Navy, and I can't tell you the date right now, but did send Farragut and his deep water ship up past Port Hudson to blockade the Red River. The Red River is coming in from Louisiana, 
That's where a lot of the supplies to Vicksburg was coming from. The only one ship made it, that was the uh, Hartford, well, uh, and the Albatross, another smaller ship. One of the ships that didn't make it was the USS Mississippi. Mississippi was a side wheeler. It ran aground right underneath the guns of Port Hudson. Had to be abandoned. A young ensign with the captain went through the whole ship before it was blown up to make sure there weren't any people left on board. Young Ensign's name was Dewey, better known for the Battle of Manila Bay. Fire when ready, Gridley. He went from Ensign to fight in another war. Other questions? I want to ask, how, how long did it take before the Union Army had rifled muskets since they didn't have them at Vicksburg? Well, now, wait a minute. You're using Union Army generally. Uh, there were lots of rifle muskets, but Grant's army was at the end of the supply line. And so, as I think I mentioned, he undoubtedly had some, but he felt he could use the 30,000 that he captured. Now, the Union Army had rifle muskets from 1857 on, but in fairly short supply. Yes, sir, you had. As you know, uh, in history things are exaggerated, but they always talk in a lot of movies about Grant having a drinking problem. Did they, that, it doesn't seem like the decisions he made were impacted by that. He they weren't. Lost anything. He might like to drink some. But well, he, he was a binge drinker. The worst thing that could happen to Grant was not to be busy. When he was in the regular army before the war, he resigned one step ahead of a court martial because he was stationed on the west coast up in Washington, I believe. Uh, all the casinos were closed. Uh, uh, he uh, didn't have much to do. It was a very boring place. He didn't have his wife with him, so he drank. Uh, after the Battle of Shiloh, things had gone very slow, didn't have much to do, he drank. Uh, there is the story that somebody went to Lincoln about Grant and his drinking problem, and supposedly Lincoln said something to the effect of, let's find out what he's drinking and I can give it to the rest of my generals. Uh, uh, that's probably paraphrasing, but uh, it's a good story anyway. Uh, he was drunk, I, forget, I think it was right after Vicksburg again. Nothing to do. And uh, he went and on a binge. But I am not aware that at any time was he under the influence in time of battle, which I always thought was interesting. His detractors always bring up the drinking problem. There were several, maybe even lots, of generals on both sides that had real drinking problems, including during battle. Uh, Benjamin Cheatham, on the Confederate side, was known for his drinking. Uh, not taking all the rich talk, but uh, um, General Sibley, who commanded the New Mexico campaign, nickname was Walking Whiskey Keg. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, 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 probably indicated some fondness for Demon Rung. I saw a show one time where they talked about the loyalty of Sherman to Grant and, you know, and the march to the sea and then heading north and all that and saving Lincoln's election in 1864 by taking Atlanta. But one of the lines they gave 
gave in there, as you did in, in a show about Grant or uh, about the Civil War, Ken Burns, was uh, Sherman said, well, I always stuck by Grant when he was drinking, and he stuck by me when I was crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because he had emotional problems, I think. Yeah. Uh, but that brings up something. Let's wrap it up. Now. Okay. When I'm ready. <laughs> Tell them to quit asking. <laughs> tell them to quit asking questions. Uh, the uh, Grant and Sherman were very loyal to each other, but uh, you know, part of Sherman's problem was you know, he was rather unique. He actually would have liked the war to end right back where it was before the war, with slaves, with the southern his, uh, aristocracy. He just didn't want to split the Union, because he had been teaching in Louisiana and had lots of friends that ended up being in the Confederacy. I am told that you can answer, can't ask any more questions. Uh, so, uh, well, you can't, just let's. Uh, <laughs> Well, could I ask something about your family? You, it says here that your dad was on the USS Texas. Yes. And fought in World War I. Was he a part of the Great White Fleet then? Uh, no. Uh, he went in in 1917. And uh, actually, our history in the Navy is similar. He started off on the Texas and ended up on the subchaser. I started off on heavy repair ships and ended up on a tugboat. So, uh, feel free to come up, since my tour guide says you can't an ask any more questions. Uh, feel free to come up. I can answer any questions about my uniform, this uniform, that uniform, the weapons, etc. Thank you for coming. Thank you.